let me introduce introduce you to them. Um, so we have uh, David Freeman and Travis Kane, directors at Sunray Consulting. We have uh, Warren Vella, who is the team lead of integration and APIs at AMO, uh, the Australian energy market operator. Ivan Nikolai, who is a specialist customer engineer at Google with a focus on Apogee. And uh, finally, Ahmed El Haruni, who is the API man uh, platform manager at uh, AGL Energy. So uh, the stage is yours. Uh, I will leave the stage and uh, yes, enjoy. Okay, I think we're just waiting for people to get their video started. And uh, Travis will introduce us. Hey, good afternoon, hey. Good afternoon all. And uh, hopefully we can all hear me okay. And uh, my name is Travis Kane, as David mentioned. Uh, I'll be your panel host for today. Um, being only one of the two panel sessions uh, discussions over the next two days of API days, I can go on record and say this will be in the top two of all panel discussions uh, you'll, you'll see. So, um, yeah, thank you all. So we're here today just to discuss about how APIs are powering the energy market. To set the scene uh, of the rate of change in this sector, I thought I would share some snippets of just basically what's happened over the last, say, 10 years in the energy sector to get us started. So when you look at, I guess, uh, the large changes in things like uh, batteries, solar, wind farms, uh, that's put a lot of changes in the way that people consume energy and store it. Um, when you look at things like government privatisation in the energy sector as well, there's basically now a split in three major types of players. There's now generators, distributors and retailers in the market. Uh, this has led to a lot of rise in, of the uh, compare the markets uh, industries. Uh, that, that puts a lot of pressure on the retailers and to provide new and way and easy ways for consumers to swap um, between different energy providers. On top of that as well, the Australian Energy Market Commission, the AEMC, a few years back announced that there's going to be a change in the settlement periods um, from spot price from 30 minutes to five, and we'll, we'll tackle that a little bit later on. And lastly, I guess, as, as you just heard from James as well, there's a big, big change in, in around the consumer data rights that's going to hit the energy sector as well. And that's the set to change things as well. So I guess with all of this, there's been huge pressure on energy retailers and regulators to keep up and find new ways to innovate and stay ahead of the competition and allow consumers to consume electricity sort of faster, easier and cheaper than before. So I've been sort of working around the energy industry now for, for a year or two, and I guess I wanted to really dive into how APIs are powering the energy market. Um, so what I thought I'd do is I'd invite some, some special guests of mine today uh, up on the stage, as Sarah mentioned. So we've got uh, uh, Warren Vella, who's an enterprise integrations architect at AEMO, the Australian energy market operator. We've got Ivan Nikolai, who's an engineer at Google. We have Ahmed El Haruni, who's an API platform manager at AGL Energy. And we've got, last but not least, David Freeman, a director at Sunray, who's an API program specialist. So before we kick off, maybe if I can ask uh, the team to introduce themselves, maybe we'll start with Warren. Tell us a bit about yourself, mate. Yeah, thanks, Travis. And thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts and uh, my experience on this panel. Um, hey, everyone. Obviously, my name is Warren Vala. I'm looking after enterprise integration architecture at AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator, um, where I've been at for some time now. And I'm currently leading our digital integration strategy, uh, really focusing on maturing our API program, especially as our energy industry undergoes a huge transformation. Thanks, Wallace. Uh, maybe Ivan, tell us about yourself. Hey, guys. Um, my name's Ivan. I'm a customer engineer here at Google Apogee. So I've got a long background in security consulting, identity standards, and now for about a, just over a year, I've been here with Apogee. So it's kind of really exciting to be working um, both in the API management space and in the CDR space, where a lot of sort of the standards discussions are, you know, stuff I come, I've been dealing with for a long time in security. Yeah, well, thanks, Ivan. And Ahmed? Thanks, Tavis. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ahmed, uh, API Platform Manager at AGL Energy. I'm looking after the uh, AGL Energy's API program um, and API standards and practices in the platform. Thanks, Ahmed. And David? Yeah, good day and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, prior to starting Sunray with Travis uh, over the last five years, I was executing Telstra's API strategy. Uh, their public developer program and monetized some of their APIs. So now I'm a director at Sonray, uh, where we create um, API and digital outcomes for Australian businesses. 
Thanks, David. Now, we've got a uh, very good task of trying to run through four, four panel uh, topics for, with all of our guests in, in under half an hour. So let's, let's, let's dive in, guys. So look, topic one I wanted to look at, uh, I guess, uh, more of a setting the scene. So um, maybe what I'd like to do is, is, is ask Warren. So, so Warren, to set the scene a little bit around today's discussion, I would like to ask you, I guess, what you've seen. I mean, you don't look at you're a young fellow, but you've been in the energy industry for about, uh, as you mentioned, over 10 years. Tell us what's changed over the last 10 years, what you've seen working in AEMO and sort of what's, um, what's, what's changing in this industry industry. Yeah, thanks for the compliment, Trevor. <laughs> Look, hands down, <laughs> the biggest change that I've seen um, really is the energy industry moving from a centralised generation base to a decentralised model uh, with the introduction of renewable energy technologies, you know, like solar, wind and batteries, and also rapidly seeing electric vehicles becoming a physical part of the grid. And we're really starting to think about what happens to the grid when everyone arrives home after work and plugs their car in to be charged at the same time, for example. And certainly over the last 30 years at AMO, I've certainly seen the, you know, the convergence of technology and the business come together. I mean, the, the technology practice was always seen as a necessary part of the business. But as we are rapidly moving to a world of sort of distributed energy, it really especially as prosumers take more control of their energy usage, technology is becoming an essential critical enabler for the energy industry. And what we're seeing is sort of the physics of energy and information technology kind of blend together to achieve this real-time flow of information. And I guess more recently, over the last five years or so, not only has the speed of data changed, um, really by moving from batch-based systems to our next generation event-based systems, for example, but the volume of data has significantly grown as we see more and more market participants, you know, ranging from small startups to large enterprises sort of join the Australian energy market. Thanks, Warren. Uh, I never thought I'd be in a world where I plug my car in to charge and I'm actually part of the grid. That's, pretty, that's gonna be pretty cool. Um, so, so let's dive one one further in. So, so Ahmed, I'd be keen to talk to you about, about um, sort of how I guess APIs specifically are playing a really critical role in, in the energy sector as well. Um, for, for, I would love to hear from you on that. Yeah, thanks, Davis. So, yes, as, as Warren mentioned, the industry is going into uh, this transformation. I think APIs are an enabler for this kind of transformation in the industry. Uh, so API is acting as universal connectors into uh, data. And as data getting more popular and more um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gross, like uh, we are getting more value out of our APIs. So really uh, APIs are similar to uh, USB connectors that we have in our devices at home, connecting multiple devices together without prior knowledge of those devices in how they work internally. API is doing the same uh, with, with our data, all sorts of data getting shaped uh, together. Uh, so API programs and platforms help facilitating that um, across, maintaining it into centralized programs instead of um, isolated gross that is hard to manage and control and secure. Uh, so AGL Energy jumped into uh, the API program space as part of the uh, uh, CXT Digital Transformation Project, uh, which was completed uh, June 2019. Uh, so today that program um, in itself holds more than 70 uh, different APIs covering all aspects of um, providing, customer, providing value for the customer. Uh, from inception, from uh, identifying different products and offers, um, up all the way to um, uh, getting usage, usage information and controlling energy consumption and so on. Uh, with the focus on, uh, so as, as Warren mentioned as well, it's not just energy um, in terms of, let's say electricity and gas. We also have uh, solar, we have batteries, uh, different APIs focusing on different um, aspects of the energy uh, market. Uh, AGL Energy as well is jumping, as you have seen the announcements, um, uh, the recent acquisition of Southern Form Company. So we are jumping into the telecommunication uh, space as well. So our strategy is really about um, uh, multi-retailing uh, as, a, as, a, as a retailer uh, provider. And APIs is a big enabler in this space, how seamlessly we can integrate uh, existing uh, AGL APIs with existing Southern Phone Company, um, um, Southern Phone uh, uh, Company APIs. Once we have done the acquisition, was uh, was a big enabler uh, for us. And uh, so far, 
We have in the platform around 5 million API requests per, per day. So it's a huge, huge traffic going into a single uh, framework, single entry point, empowering different applications like mobile apps and uh, my account application and even the uh, Google Home and Amazon Alexa applications. So um, API is really crucial for uh, for for those uh, for this purpose. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ahmed. And uh, that's a that's a lot of APIs and five million API calls. That's a lot. Um, not that it's a yeah. competition, Warren, but um, yeah. tell me about Aemo and, and how many API calls do you have? And uh, yeah, we're keen to understand how Aemo is, I guess, enabling with their API strategy um, there. Yeah, look, look, many, many millions of API calls, but really um, APIs are really important to the energy sector, especially as we look to sort of manage this mammoth task of coordinating the flow of energy, you know, really from its source of generation to where it's consumed in both in its physical sense, but also a financial sense. Um, in other words, the actual market itself, you know, it really requires us to enable the flow of data in a secure, but really massively scalable way. And a APIs are really the enabler for us and how we see the next generation of the energy market systems working. And starting from how we look to receive bids and offers into the market, uh, to receiving and providing meter data from Australian households, to virtually coordinating a group of households to become this virtual power plant. Uh, APIs have given us the, the flexibility to open our data in this secure way. And traditionally for the market, our, our main form of integration was via batch-based systems, you know, over private FTP networks, which as you can imagine, quickly became a bottleneck in our innovation, especially as we rapidly need to continuously onboard new entrants into the market itself. But, but I think most importantly, APIs really give us the control that we need to ensure that our services and products are exposed in a managed, but more importantly, secure way. And we, we've been on our core API journey for the last four years or so, but I would say that we are just sort of starting to find our feet now um, because you can quite easily deploy an API management platform and start exposing your data pretty quickly. But the real challenge is how you do this with the product mindset, I think. And I think look, with the help of Google and Sunway, Sunray, we've recently completed you know, documenting and agreeing on our API management approach, which covers topics like naming standards, sort of security patterns, and how we shift just from enabling API to actually uh, thinking about this from a product mindset point of view, which, which I'm personally very proud of. And look, as we continue to build our next gen market systems, APIs are going to be that true enabler for a large scale sort of coordinated distributed energy network in Australia. Yeah, well, thanks, Warren. And um, maybe before we move to the next topic, maybe I'll quickly throw to you, David. Uh, you, you obviously speak to a lot of different companies and, and different areas around APIs and governance, as, as Warren mentioned. Uh, how do you see, I guess, the important um, aspect from a more outside in, from an AGL and an AMO perspective about the importance of APIs play? Yeah, the importance of APIs in the energy sector. Yeah, I'll probably tell a bit of a personal anecdote, actually. Um, so it was interesting, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine who started a uh, new company, an energy comparison company called Bill Crunch. And these guys, they come in. They, they broker and find uh, an energy plan that best fits your needs. And, and the whole goal of their company is to try and do that in a self-serve way as possible for the customer. They don't have to talk to anyone. They just put in their details, select the plan and cut over. So already with that example, it's pretty clear that uh, they're using API integration pretty extensively back into energy retailers. Now, in having a chat to him, one of the key pieces of information that I'd love to have in their company is this near real-time access to meter data so that when the user inputs their information in the bill crunch, uh, it pulls back that real-time data set uh, it's in, and that's interrogated to help um, construct their energy plan comparison. Now, interestingly enough, that data is actually now available from AEMO through the CDP API. And so that open access uh, to energy usage for, for brokerage companies like Bill Crunch uh, can be a game changer for, for consumers. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get onto CDR and energy. But if we apply that analogy um, of that energy comparison company having access to something like CDP API and that near real-time data of, uh, of meters, if we apply that analogy to retailers distributors and, and generators uh, and you provide that data on energy cheaply, securely and easily uh, to those market participants, all of a sudden you're enabling that tremendous innovation and opportunities. And we've already seen that in other industries. I guess most of my experience has been 
in telecommunications. And when we saw those APIs opening up, you know, you get companies like Twilio uh, that start up and such. And it's not until that data is cheaply and easily accessible that you see these innovative services cropping up, uh, the barriers of entries drop and uh, existing and new entrants uh, come into the market. And that just provides uh, benefits to consumers uh, all over the place. Yeah, well, thanks, David. And um, maybe to quickly switch topics here for a minute, um, let, let's uh, mention earlier diving into the 5MS. So um, basically, as I mentioned earlier, there's a big change coming around the settlement period. So today, suppliers and retailers, basically the billing prices are on an average of 30 minute intervals um, today. But when you look at, I guess, the introduction of capabilities such as batteries and solar farms and wind farms that, that sort of Warren mentioned earlier, um, those kind of com- those type of technologies, they, the, the energy fluctuates a lot. It, it's a much, much sort of more compared to traditional gas or coal. So there's really a need to change that settlement of, of, the, um, the, of the power in from 30 minutes to five minutes. So that's been a big change in the market coming through and it's going to be rolled out over the next couple of years. Um, Warren, I'd like to, to, to see how is, how is AEMO, I guess, tackling this, this 5MS change and, and, and how do you expect 5MS to, to change the market as well? Yeah, look, 5MS is a great example and I think a critical kind of first step um, indication of how our energy industry is shifting and sort of the pace that it's shifting at. And by taking something like settlement period, by simply aligning both the settlement and dispatch intervals, uh, the market systems, like you mentioned, you know, require metering data down from, you know, 30 minutes down to five minute intervals. And if you sort of multiply that for every household in the NEM and, and suddenly what you get is systems that um, support metering and settlements across the whole energy industry starting to burst at the seams. And I think the real opportunity here is to reimagine how our systems um, can be architected in such a way that sort of leverages the benefits of the cloud, uh, such as like an elastic scaling, but really facaded by these APIs. And, and like all the other energy industry participants, AEMO you know, has been gearing up and really re-engineering a lot of our systems to support this change. And we've positioned APIs as kind of the front door to a lot of our energy market systems. You know, for example, like we've mentioned, we are using APIs uh, for the integration and the ingestion of meter data from households into our national meter data database. And also for the first time, allowing bids and offers into the market system to be submitted uh, into the market via APIs. But obviously don't forget, just like many other um, organizations, AMO and, and the energy industry also has lots of existing um, systems that you know, must be able to talk to our next generation systems. And we feel that APIs have really enabled us to bridge this gap. Thanks, Warren. That's a, that's a lot of data when you think about it with the uh, national energy market pulling data from every single sort of household every five minutes. That's, that's a lot of ingestion. Um, I mean, from an AGL perspective, I guess, you would, you would be thinking of ways to to, to change the market here, but also consuming AMO's APIs around this. Um, how is AGL looking at 5MS? And, and we can understand um, sort of what, what's the focus area for AGL in this space? Yeah, so we, we look at five minute settlement as a good testing use case for how our IT systems are actually ready for change, change in the business. Uh, so in many initiatives like five minute settlement, like CDR, there's multiple initiatives coming up that just open our minds to look back to our IT systems and make sure that they are actually ready for such changes happening uh, in future. How to be proactive uh, rather than being reactive is really important for us. The time between um, knowing about an initiative and actually rolling out a change to be ready for our consumers is actually a big um, it's, it's a big, uh, uh, to, it, it's an important aspect in how we, uh, how we work. Um, so we talking about five minute settlements and uh, we are talking about six times data points um, uh, needs to be collected. We're talking about different number or like uh, double the number of um, uh, in, ingestion uh, capability, uh, data downloads, uh, processing, even presentation capabilities, because at, at some aspect, like even from a digital perspective, we currently look at the usage data in uh, 30 minutes intervals, but looking at something like batteries, uh, where our, our people in the uh, battery usage area, they are actually looking at this in a five minutes interval 
rather than uh, 30. So it tells us that um, five minute settlements is in the in the right path, like because we need to be um, we need to be up to speed with uh, with the more innovative um, uh, uh, new energy uh, coming up. And also our systems need to be elastic, need to be uh, scalable to cater for the uh, increasing amount of uh, compute and uh, uh, bandwidth and, and, and data, uh, data points processing, it forcing us to look at um, different models of eventing like streaming and uh, innovative models or, um, uh, of um, uh, data storage to cater for uh, such increasing amount of data and so on. Uh, so we have been like in our partnership with Microsoft have been also focusing on our infrastructure and our event streaming and API uh, infrastructure that helps in uh, deal with such increasing uh, load in a way that it works with five minute settlement as well as being ready for um, uh, new initiatives in future as well. Thanks, I mean, So maybe, uh, Ivan, you, you heard from um, from Warren and Ahmed around, I guess, uh, the typical keywords like scale, um, flexibility, uh, all those kinds of data ingestion points. Uh, I guess I'd be, I'd be keen to, to pick your brain. You, you spent a lot of time, as you mentioned earlier, talking to customers' API design, security, um, What's your view on how Google is supporting um, customers in, in Apogee around that sort of API design and scalability? Yeah, it's really exciting to like to, to be working with these systems at these levels of scale. Like, you know, it's it's just fun and exciting. Uh, and, you know, since the new payments platform, CDR in Europe, which, you know, Apogee was really key in back in the day. Um, and just generally, Apogee works a lot in the mission critical sector. Um, so when you're dealing with just these amazing volumes, like it's every techie's dream, you know, to deal with these volumes, you have to solve for extreme scalability, um, you know, extreme reliability, extreme availability. And, you know, these are almost like high frequency trading systems. They're both critical infrastructure and the volumes are just insane. So. Um, what's really exciting to see is um, at Apogee, there's always been a philosophy of multi-cloud and multi-deployment approach. And and what we're seeing with these mission-critical customers is there is no single sort of deployment approach. Like it's the recommendation is just always to be really careful and how do you say um, results focused um, when you're dealing with these systems at scale. If you have a small system, you know, a little bit of uptake, it's not critical to your business. You can just sort of be very prescriptive about a deployment option or model. Um, whereas in this case, I'm, I'm not going to advocate for any single model because what's really curious is every single customer dealing with these mission critical systems at scale has found a completely different solution that works for them. Um, and I guess the important thing is, you know, you might have enterprise architects to sort of start off with, you know, this looks really pretty on paper, um, but then it, when you need to hit the, the road, the, you know, the rubber needs to hit the road, um, I just say be really, um, be really sort of data driven and results driven, and you'll be surprised what works at scale and what doesn't. And, you know, it, you could come with a cloud first approach and then realize your data center works better or vice versa, there there often is like a you know there could be like a an idea that public cloud can't hit the scale or reliability, and then it, it does. So um, definitely just be open for surprises and be really sort of results driven in your assessment of your deployment options. Thanks, Ivan. I know there's a bunch of um, API architects sitting there going, "Oh, he's gonna he's gonna give me the magic formula." Ah, oh, there is no going on. Come on. Um, so you mentioned, Ivan, I guess, around the CDR. Obviously, you know, the previous uh, entire presentation for those who caught it from James Bly was dedicated to CDR. Uh, it, it is the, the the big thing changing the market around um, sort of, you know, really they, they, the how to expose data safely, securely and all those kind of things. And, it, it, you know, if you caught the last previous presentation, you'd be an expert by now. I guess... Um, you obviously speak to a lot of customers uh, and different different partners. What is your feel, I guess, the way that the Googles are also playing a role in this rollout of CDR? Yeah, look, that, that previous presentation was great from, from James. 
Um, and, you know, sort of what Apogee seen both in, in the, you know, I often refer to Europe experience just because it's a few years ahead, but um, Australia now is leading the way with CDR and energy. And, and what we like to think of is, is just beyond compliance. In the old days when you wanted to build networks or build ecosystems, or really from like a business perspective, you wanted to build capability and build revenue, you had to actually go out and build branches in remote locations like bank branches, you know, shopping centers. Um, and CDR is basically taking a lot of the difficulty out of doing that. When you're talking about building digital ecosystems. And, and as you've seen, Travis, with with non-regulated sectors like telcos, like retail, you have to start from scratch in defining the data model, defining the security standards, and you have all the risk resting on yourself, right? Like if I don't properly secure this API, expose it, and a risk happens, then it's all on me. So, so the way I see the Data61 initiative is it's open, it's collaborative, um, and a lot of the risk is being pooled around these standards. You don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. Um, and that really takes half of the effort of building API-driven ecosystems. So if you just see it as compliance, it's just something else to do. It's just a cost center. If you see it as taking fundamentally a lot of the risk out of, um, out of your ecosystem, that's where we really see uh, the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Ivan. And maybe, David, to pull on that a, a little bit, obviously, I've mentioned and I agree, like a lot of people see sort of CDR as more of a tick box. Oh, my God, what, what, what do I have to do now kind of thing rather than maybe the chance it is to contribute and, and offer something to the market because all, all of the forums, all of the standards are open. You can read them. You can contribute to them. You can join the groups. Um, you know, what have you seen? I guess you're talking to a lot of different people, plus your experience at Telstra around running the API program and governance. I guess the telco is another one on the, on, on the panel eventually be coming through. Um, love to hear your thoughts on, on the CDR approach. Yeah, look, I think CDR obviously has got a great chance of providing a more competitive market uh, that will benefit consumers. Um, there's an immense amount of data uh, in energy companies and operators, and that data can be put to good use for the market and for consumers. So I guess overall there's that intent um, to have open, easily accessible information for consumers and also that transparency on who has your data and whether they're allowed to use that data. Um, so there is also that other side of the coin as well, you know, with every technology and regulation that comes in, you know, there's the good, the bad and unintended consequences. So. Uh, you could also take the view that you know, opening that data up, which has previously been closed, or at least very difficult to access across providers, this new openness could also be used for bad ends as well, right? I mean, you take the, you know, the recent trends around, you know, persona non grata and cancel culture and uh, state, state actors, if you will, um, does uh, this open up possibilities for those uh, individuals being targeted and shut off from energy services, as an example? Uh, of course, there's carrots and sticks uh, in the legislation um, across CDR aiming to stop misuse of that consumer data. But I think this is certainly one area will be under closer scrutiny as CDR is rolled out across other services. Uh, we've already got it across finance. Uh, we're now going into energy and telecommunications. So soon we'll have uh, you know, every critical service that every man or woman uses for their everyday lives will be under CDR. So, so certainly that scrutiny is going to be uh, really important to make sure that that data remains uh, secure. Um, but I guess my overall perspective, like telecommunications, um, you know, phone bills are very complex. Uh, I know that, dealing with them, and we're all consumers dealing with them. But we've got the same thing in energy as well, right? So complexity of rates, you know, tariffs, uh, usage charges at different times across different energy plans. So it can be very hard for, for customers to compare and understand whether they're getting good deals. So if CDR can play a, a good role in simplifying energy usage in comparison, as well as protecting uh, those consumers from bad actors, then it's going to lead to good outcomes, that's for sure. Thanks, David. So, so maybe let's 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 look at it from a, a consumer point of view. Uh, Ahmed, so maybe wrap us up, mate. Obviously, close out strong for our panel discussion today. So obviously with all the talk in CDR, how's our AGL's approach? Give us the gloss, mate. Are they ticking the box or are they really seeing it as a way to innovate and change the market? 
I'm not taking the box. In fact, I'm, I'm advising all um, you know energy organization to uh, look at CDR not from a governance requirement perspective to to try to uncover the value of uh, CDR for customers' uh, benefits, for organization benefit as well. So uh, it really provides the potential of building a new kind of applications um, that is collecting data from multiple sources uh, like different energy organizations and banking uh, and in future telecommunication organizations as well, uh, which I'm sure it's going to open the market to um, you know um, different kind of uh, applications. Uh, trying to uh, solve business problems and customer problems from a, from a different perspective than our traditional uh, applications. I was having a look at um, some, some posts online for some people actually, um, uh, someone actually built like a CLI tool for, uh, for, for banking uh, uh, APIs. And the concept, like they, they say that um, now you can actually, you know, write a a unit test for business, right? Because all those businesses available um, in their like pricing uh, information and product information, uh, once they become available, you can actually test the business itself, right? The same way we we, we test our code. So it's really interesting uh, uh, that, that there is a different way to think about uh, data and CDR actually helps uh, much facilitate um, uh, that. Uh, so um, from a, from a, uh, uh, from a standards and uh, uh, best practices perspective, uh, which I even reach out uh, slightly, we, we often, even our, in our internal team discussions, we refer to CDR as if, um, okay, Data61 have already done the consultation. They have already uh, invested in it. Why, why can't we take, talk, take these decisions? And if we can actually apply it to our own APIs, and uh, that would be really um, uh, effective because we don't have to uh, redo the work, right? And uh, so it's um, it's really interesting the way you look at CDR. You can look at it from a productive, um, a positive mindset, or you can look at it um, as a compliance thing. So you're not you're not getting the full uh, benefit out of it. Um, as as it has mentioned before, and in James' uh, session as well, everything is open. Um, uh, all the decisions, all the proposals, all the contributions, uh, which is a unique opportunity for us to go into this, uh, you know, like this heritage of uh, discussions and decision making and technical uh, design and learn from it, uh, use it to uh, apply CDR, uncover value for CDR, but also use it for our own energy industry um, uh, in the uh, decisions that's actually touching our applications regardless regardless of uh, CDR. Um, one last thing I want to mention about CDR is privacy and, and security. So uh, the privacy of our customers is um, our highest pri priority. So every decision we, um, we are looking at it from a, a CDR perspective, we always put uh, the customer's privacy uh, lens, right? And try to, um, to make sure that wh wh while we are enabling more value for customers. We are not sacrificing um, and their privacy. We are not sacrificing the, the, their security, uh, which is also one of the uh, goals for uh, Data61 and the uh, CDR uh, uh, consultations. So yeah, I, I advise companies, organizations, not not to uh, think about it as a governance requirements. It's to go in detail and try to uh, use it for uh, for their benefit. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Ahmed. And um, look, look, folks, that, that sort of wraps up our, our panel discussion today. Um, I really want to uh, kind of feel like we kind of scratched the surface of some of these topics. Obviously, it was short, fast. It was almost like the scratchy. You've got the two Liberty Bells and you want to see if you get the third one. Um, look, if you want to hear more, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we run a meetup group as well. Um, hit up David and I, we're looking to get the guys back and do a more of a detailed session. We've got more time. Um, massive thank you to, to Warren, Ahmed, Ivan and David for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I think I'm going to jump back and, and leave and add Sarah back in and maybe if there's 30 seconds or so for some questions, we'll, we'll throw it out of questions. But um, thank, thanks, everyone, and, and I'll leave and, and get Sarah back in. Thanks, Trav. <laughs> All right, we'll wait for Sarah to come back in and uh, see if there's any questions. Otherwise, might be stunned silence from the crowd. 
<laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that was a very stimulating discussion. And uh, I must say, uh, personally, for me as well, you know, um, I've had the experience of being a Deloitte consultant with uh, working with AMO, you know, at the beginning of that journey. So, uh, yeah, it's great to hear how you talk about um, data sharing and APIs, uh, <clears throat> how they will be used to drive innovations in this industry. Um, so I think we are kind of yeah running out of time, but we have a couple of questions. Um, how do you see AMO and market participants working together in the future to design APIs that will provide value to the end customer? That's I can probably take take that one, yeah. Sarah. It's certainly mm -hmm. a small API community as well, isn't it? Um, just look, just quickly, I think from an AMO perspective, what we've seen work well is taking sort of a consumer first mindset and really adopting this outward in approach. Um, most of our API consumers were traditionally energy industry participants like retailers and distributors, but we are quickly starting to see consumers also taking a keen interest in their metadata and energy profile, for example. So we really need to cater for a wide range of uh, API consumers, which range from you know, technical energy technical specialists or you know, IT professionals, especially as CDR sort of really takes off. Um, we regularly run consultation workshops with, uh, workshops with the energy participants um, and where we explore topics like what does the data model look like? Should it be XML? Should it be JSON? How should we name our API resources with this product mindset? And I think if we take VPP as an example um, of how we're taking this iterative um, shared demonstration approach, you know, we're really looking to kind of learn, um, take the learnings from VPP and kind of mature it as time goes on, especially as we work with the likes of AGL and Tesla, for example. Um, I'm yet to meet Elon himself, though. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. Um, one more question. How do you monitor 70 plus APIs and all the traffic? Maybe uh, Ivan? Or... <laughs> Interesting good question. Uh, what, one of the biggest benefits of having a centralized API program is, uh, is also a centralized location for monitoring uh, all uh, APIs and the tra traffic that goes into it. So actually having, um, having to worry about or having to maintain 70 APIs um, if it's part of a, a, a single platform, a single uh, API gateway, it makes it easy to monitor um, rather than monitor 70 APIs in isolation. So if we like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, want to have the task of monitoring uh, 70 APIs that lives in different islands. Uh, however, having um, having them uh, uh, contributing to in in the same platform. Uh, uh, relying on um, technologies like, in, in our case, relying on Azure technologies like Azure Application Insights and uh, uh, Azure Monitor and Azure Alerts and stuff like that, makes it really easy to uh, uh, to monitor traffic that goes into all these uh, APIs, also with the microservices that also behind them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think just to add sort of one more thing to there as well. Um, I think what's what we found really useful is to think about you know, APIs not just at the front door as well, but sort of as a request all the way through the system. So um, techniques like using a common ID between the front door API mm -hmm. and your backend microservice certainly helps with uh, understanding which parts of your system you know the API request um, flowed through, and that could be multiple microservices, for example. So I think we adopted that um, quite early on when we quickly realized we needed a way to string these API requests together. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the session now. Um, thank you to all our speakers and the audience for joining us this session. And it has certainly been very enjoyable. So um, we will, I think, resume at uh, 2.50 Australian uh, Eastern Standard Time to uh, in about 20 minutes time for the next. Thank you all. Great. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.